Good afternoon and welcome to today, a segment of today's commemoration of the first anniversary of the insurrection in Washington. I'm Bill Mills, retired editorial page editor of the Cape Cod Times. And I was asked to moderate a discussion today with Congressman Bill Keating, who was at the Capitol last January 6th, and Nat Nathaniel Philbrook of Nantucket, the award-winning author and historian. First, I want to sincerely thank Congressman Keating for his honorable service to our country, especially during these difficult times. And I want to thank Mr. Philbrick for his scholarship and devotion to uncovering truths about American history. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Let, let's begin with Congressman Keating. Congressman, this is a somber anniversary, but please take us back one year ago today, you were there. What did you experience? Well, actually, I think of the night before. Uh, I came into uh, the Capitol. Uh, I, I was aware there'd be a, a, a rally, I thought, at the time. Uh, and I was walking in with a colleague, Republican colleague, and I, you know, we talked about what was going to happen the next day. And, and he came to me and, and said, you know, this is going to be a real S show, for lack of a better term. And I said, really? I said, that's not the sense I get. And, and immediately looking back, I realized there were two worlds here, uh, the social media and what he was getting for a message for that day and what I was getting uh, as a Democrat. So uh, that evening, I walked around and talked to the Capitol Police. There were rallies going on, one in front of the Supreme Court, one in front of the Capitol. Uh, people were very energized in front of the Capitol. Uh, but I talked to the Capitol Police, the Metropolitan Police, the Supreme Court Police, as I walked around listening, and, and they all thought they had the matter under control. I asked them, how does it look for tomorrow? And they said, we've got it, uh, we're coordinated. Uh, I think back uh, uh, at that moment, saying how we weren't prepared for what was about to happen. And that day, uh, because of COVID, uh, interestingly enough, because of the protocols, there weren't many people in the chamber at one time. We kept the numbers down, which really, as it turned out, was very important because it helped evacuate uh, the balcony and uh, the floor. But as I was walking over to the Capitol uh, to watch the events, uh, I had an emergency alert on my phone. And it said that the Library of Congress, one of the buildings, was being evacuated. We get a lot of alerts. I didn't anticipate something like that. It caught my attention and it struck me Perhaps something has happened there, but I always thought it would be minor in scope. Then I got a second alert as I proceeded, and it said it warned members and staff and everyone in the Cannon House office building, evacuate to the Rayburn building, the building I just left. And I began to think, I better head back. And then I had the third alert when that was happening, saying, get to your office immediately, shelter in place, lock and and board up your doors. Don't go near a window. And I suddenly realized this was uh, something extraordinary. And as the news came forth that day, um, some from the outside that we were getting from television, some from the internal uh, conversations that were occurring among staff members. My staff members weren't in the building, thank goodness, uh, because of the COVID issues. So I was in the office alone, but I, they were giving me up-to-date messages. And it was the moment, I think, where there were reports, and sadly true reports, that there were explosives that had been planted a few blocks away uh, at the Democratic uh, headquarters and the Republican headquarters, that I realized there was actual strategizing and some kind of plot going on. That was obviously a, di a diversionary tactic. So at that moment, I said, this is really uh, a scope and a direction uh, I don't think anyone could fully anticipate. Did you have to stay in your office until you finally had to vote for the certification? We were, we were directed, stay in your office, do not go anywhere. Uh, and uh, because people had broken the perimeter. And once you get in the perimeter uh, of the building, you're attached to everything else, with tunnels uh, and other methods. So there's right. no way uh, to secure off anyone's spot. Uh, and, you know, staff members were giving minute-by-minute minute reports that were filtering back to me. 
that uh, the speaker's office had been uh, breached, the people in the speaker's office. Uh, one of my colleagues took a, a, a you know, a symbol, a trophy of a, an axe, an actual mask off the axe off the wall. And he had it by his de desk to protect himself. It should someone come through the office. So just to set the tone, this was very real. It, it took a turn that even those of us who see protests and we walk by them every day uh, as we go to work, uh, we immediately realized the severity of this and, and how dangerous it was. And uh, we're getting uh, information filtered to us uh, just informally through staff. Right. Before we go over to Nat, uh, I just wanted to ask you, Congressman, what's been your relationship like with your colleagues across the aisle since last January 6th? Have you still been able to maintain some friendships with colleagues? It's, it's different since then. Clearly, this marked a difference. There's a core of uh, uh, my colleagues that uh, really, uh, because of a, a warped sense of ego or uh, very extremist views themselves, that would be very difficult to work with, not just for me as a Democrat, but that same feeling it has been expressed time and time again from my Republican colleagues with that core group. Uh, and these are people, some of them, that as the investigation unfolds, uh, are clearly, clearly have been, had involvement in this uh, of some nature. We're going to find more about that going on as the investigation goes. With my other colleagues, uh, as you're aware, there was a vote to uh, ratify the certification of, of the election, usually a very procedural vote. Uh, and 139 of my colleagues voted not to certify uh, what they knew, uh, the vast majority, was a free and fair election. Now, in their instances, I view that vote, uh, many of them, the vast majority of them, didn't believe uh, that the election was fraudulent. They made a calculation, a political calculus, that uh, for them, they knew uh, that vote wasn't going to be determinative. And it was just easier for them to vote that way and, and not have a primary op opponent, not have a well-funded opponent, not have having one with the... Uh, uh, now ex-president would be involved against them. They made that calculus that it's better to vote this way. It's not going to make a difference. And uh, it's easier for me. Uh, and to me, political calculus uh, is no substitute for uh, adhering to the responsibility, the oath we take in office to uphold the Constitution. And this is clearly in that that lane. Uh, and... Uh, and actually uh, not being patriotic, not being true to your country. And so that was very disappointing. Uh, but there were people that did that. Some of those people, I really feel in my heart, uh, if they were the determinative vote, they wouldn't have voted that way. Yeah. But to me, uh, that's really no excuse for voting that way. Right. Uh, Mr. Philbrick, we need some, some uh, context here. Uh, you've written some great books about historical events including the Mayflower, uh, The Last Stand. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to capture some event that's happening today, continuing to happen today. But uh, how do you think historians will look back at the events of January 6th? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Congressman Keating, thank you for that account. I mean, it's just, even though it's a year ago, it's just, oh, oh my goodness. Um, and, you know, it, how will the how will the the future look back? It's it's really hard um, to, to determine that. Any historian who can claim uh, to know where it's all headed is fooling uh, themselves. Um, the the one thing the the uh, the subject of history has taught me is humility. Uh, we really we're too much in the present to really have any sense of where it's going. But all I can say is this is absolutely unprecedented. Um, uh, this attack on the Capitol. I mean, the the Capitol and the White House were burned down by the British <laughs> during the War of eighteen twelve. So you know there have been acts of violence against that, but that was in a war. Um, that this is something that's occurring from within our country. 
Um, and you, know, you look at the revolution. It wasn't just us against Great Britain. Uh, there were loyalists and there were patriots. There always have been political divisions in this country. Uh, the, the writing of the Constitution created um, divisions. Whether you were a Federalist for the Constitution and a strong federal government or you were an anti-Federalist and you distrusted that strong uh, federal government. These divisions have always uh, existed. I mean, what is this country is about and what the Constitution was trying to create was a system of laws by which these kinds of differences of political opinion, and there will always be, it's part of how a democracy works, but the Constitution created a system of laws uh, that the transfer of power from one person to another, from one party to the other, and remember, parties did not exist when the Constitution was written, mm -hmm. will be peaceable, uh, will be civil. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, never before in my experience, or, and when you look at history, what well, do pe people can, you know, complain about an election and claim that there were individual acts of, of dishonesty and things like that. But to, 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 to claim that the whole process is somehow tainted is really unprecedented and and gets at the very heart of what this political system is about. We as as members of a republic and a democracy, we have to have faith in our elections. Otherwise, um, none of this works. And so, this is a very serious time in our history, and um, and we we cannot just uh, uh, brush the the reality of of last January six under the rug. Um, because, you know, you have to, if we are going to march into the future, we have to uh, look in the past. And the one last thing, how will we look at this in the future, I think has a lot to do with how the American people respond to this challenge. Do we stay a democracy or do we become an autocracy? And if we become an autocracy, it will be looked back as that seminal moment when, um, a, you know, a dictator, an autocrat, was able to come in. If we're going to remain a democracy, it will be looked at entirely different, and it's all up to us. You're absolutely right, uh, Mr. Philbrook, about how this is a very serious time in our country's history. Angus King of Maine, he wrote an op-ed in the Globe saying, we are currently in a constitutional crisis. Uh, Congressman Keating, your colleague Jim McGovern up in, in Worcester just had an op-ed in the Globe saying that the coup is continuing. This isn't over. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. This is ongoing. I think that's one of the important reasons to look back uh, a year back at what happened, because we have to understand it in its totality. Uh, we still aren't there yet. Uh, that's why the importance of having this uh, investigation uh, that's occurring, a bipartisan investigation that's occurring, is so critical, not only to find out the logistics of what happened, to take precautions in terms of security, but in a larger sense to say, how did it get here? Where are we going and what can we do about it? And that's the scope of this investigation to me. And that's why it's so important, but we're clearly doing that. Look what's, look what's happening right now uh, around the country. Uh, and it's really interesting as Nat mentioned, when, at, at the beginnings of our country, there were no political parties at, at that time. Uh, uh, you know, Alexander Hamilton, was concerned uh, about the ability of a new country with new people uh, experimentally dealing with democracy, that you needed a protection. So uh, that's where the Electoral College sprung from. But parties came in the 1800s and they, were, they had guidelines, uh, guardrails rather, around them. They protected us from the extremists, those parties themselves. Uh, and uh, there were downsides to that uh, manner of going forward, but that protection was there. The protection isn't there now. That's part of the difference. Uh, and so what we're seeing around the country right now, uh, as we speak, is an institutionalization of this trying to affect our democratic voting process. You know, uh, voting isn't, a democracy isn't just voting. It's voting and counting the votes. You know, you can have voting, but what good is the vote if it's not counted properly? So in our country right now, 
uh, we have uh, so many states moving forward, trying to change the law uh, right now. The 49 states have uh, legislation in to restrict voting in one way or another. Uh, and the, in the results of those, four, you know, 19 of those states have already, just in the past legislative year, uh, enacted 34 voting laws that constrain the right uh, to vote and the access to voting. So it's ongoing. Uh, we're seeing that with uh, people that are taking positions that were nonpartisan before, election commissioners, uh, secretaries of state that were uh, had a uh, strong, strong allegiance to nonpartisanship uh, and fairness in voting. All of a sudden, these positions uh, are now uh, being run for or appointed to based on, in some states, their allegiance to a big lie. Uh, that occurred uh, in this latest 2020 presidential election. And so we're seeing the institutionalization of this attempt to undercut democracy continue forward at the state and local level, as well as the federal level. Mr. Philbrick, uh, speaking of this issue that the congressman just brought up about voting rights, um, do you see any parallels between what's happening today and what happened in the post-Reconstruction era of the Jim Crow laws where they had the poll taxes, where they had literacy tests. Do you see any parallels? Yeah, disturbing parallels. I mean, you know, what it, it's effectively um, stuffing the ballot box before the, the, the election begins. If you start to limit um, people's access to to their to the the polls to democracy and uh, you know this stuff has happened before in all sorts of ways Jeremy you know there's all sorts of ways to manipulate this and and um, you know there there's been situations where uh, you know uh, you know, all sorts of bad things have happened, but what's disturbing now is we have the rule of law, and by a, by manipulating the rule of law, you know, it's instant. As Bill was saying, it's institutionalizing uh, something that is limiting our democracy, and this is these are the first steps towards um, creating um, a runway for an autocrat, um, where that you know there really is no way to tolerate any difference of a political opinion because, uh, you know, it will be contested, whether it's having ruffians in the, the uh, at the polling places, whether it's, 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 uh, you know, physically limiting people's ability to get there. I mean, th this is disturbing stuff. And, and it, it really has to be something that's monitored from an objective point of view, rather than uh, a partisan one, because, uh, you know, where it could lead is, is you know, there's so many countries in this world that show you where it will lead. And um, well, um, um, we've got to be very careful. Speaking of yeah, that. And I think, I think that uh, you hit it on the head, too, that uh, our founding fathers were concerned about this. They were concerned about an autocrat, uh, a dictator, uh, authoritarian rule. Uh, and that's why they put in the Electoral College. Uh, but we've had in our past, in our history, in, the, in our country, we've had people uh, like Father Coughlin, and we've had people like Huey Long, we've had uh, people like George Wallace or Joe McCarthy. We've had these people in, in our history, but the party self-policed. They did not allow these extreme people to take the next step uh, to be a candidate for uh, president. Uh, but I think in 1968, after the Chicago Convention and other things, there was another step where the primaries, uh, which had evolved during the 1900s, those primaries then in the conventions, those primaries became binding after that. And people thought that was a reform, and it may indeed be. But we've seen how that system now has created uh, an avenue for an autocrat uh, to come in and move and those informal uh, safety controls that the parties themselves, the major parties control, are gone. Well, there's, a, there's another factor we haven't talked about that's, uh, that did not happen back in the McCarthy era, and that's the issue of the fractured media. Um, how has, uh, and this is guess, a question for either one of you or both of you, how do you feel that the proliferation of social media, talk radio, uh, internet in general, has contributed to these deep divisions. Uh, 
Uh, if I, uh, I think it's a, a primary contribution. I, it's, you know, it, it, for all of us, it just feels different now. I mean, you know, just to be a human being in this world and it's social media. Um, it's, it's, it's where, you know, you, you cannot turn on the TV and, and trust who you're, you're going to hear from, you know, it's not just those three networks where there is some curating going on when it comes to the news. We now through social media have, um, in this proliferation of, of all these avenues of getting at you, um, what, you know, the, you're not getting expanded points of view. What you're getting are people getting into their little bunkers of what they believe and reinforcing those beliefs. And once you're in the bunker, it's very easy to man manipulate uh, what you learn. Um, you know, we're all at some point potentially gullible. <laughs> and um, and what happens uh, with this social media um, rat hole that um, can consume people is that uh, you can be... Uh, you know, conditioned to believe things that are patently false, and um, and that's what we're seeing. And as and as you know, once we we dislodge ourselves from reality, um, anything can happen. And it means uh, the the people of this country are very deeply vulnerable to those who can who know how to manipulate um, those those avenues of, of dissemination of 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 the media. And so it's I think it's. A, a very big part of it. And, and we've just got to begin to get some kind of handle on it. Yeah. I think it, the story I relayed at the outset of a, a Republican friend of mine walking in uh, to our offices, uh, both of us had a different reality of what could happen the next day uh, mm -hmm. on January 6th. But you look at what's happened uh, and you look back even to the sixties and seventies and even more recently, I think, and you'll see that, journalism bill and, and you were a, an editor uh and had control of this and you you lived in an era and, and worked in an era uh a recent era where there'd be journalistic controls uh you would have if you had a story you quite often would have a policy of having two people confirming that story there were there were protections built in to make sure what was printed or what was uh transmitted through the electronic media uh, was true to the best of your ability uh, people couldn't just wander off and, and publish a story or uh, have a story broadcast uh, that was patently false. But now you can because those controls are not on there. But what's happening right now, uh, as we look back at January 6th and, and what was happening and what we're living with and what we're going to have to contend with is deeper than that. When people are authoritarian figures, and you see it, whether it's in Hungary uh, with Orban or Putin in Russia or Xi in uh, China, uh, Erdogan in Turkey, you can go around the world. But you see the next step where the media is delegitimized by these authoritarians. They, in some countries, they can censor that as they're doing so successfully in China and Russia in other countries, they can just contest it and spread falsehoods uh, to undercut uh, the truth that way. And this demonizing of the media, historically, I think Nat probably can reflect back on this, back to our own early days, perhaps. But uh, the demonizing of a legitimate media and free press is part of authoritarian rule. And indeed, it's one of the real threats we're facing today. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and uh, Bill Mills, um, you know, from your experience, uh, uh, you know, it, you today it is just a whole different. There isn't anything really. There isn't a newsroom, I don't think. It's, it, it's, it, is, it is sad. I mean, I was trained to be a gatekeeper. As Bill said, we were trained to verify facts. Um, and what kills me is that I think uh, a lot of young people today, they're not media savvy. Like I've tried to teach my kids how to de decipher a credible site from a site that is not very credible. Right. And my own adult children have told me that most of their friends don't know how to do that. Uh, so so it, is, it is scary. Um, and and uh, you know, this whole thing about everybody's a citizen journalist these days, you know, journalists were trained. I went through four years of college to learn what I learned. But it's like, would you get on a, on a plane with, a, with someone who doesn't know how to fly a, a, a plane? 
but people are willing to accept information uh, from illegitimate sources. And they don't realize how that's a threat to democracy. Democracy depends on an informed citizenry. And unfortunately, it seems like half the country is not well informed. And, and Bill, it, you mentioned the word scary with journalists. Uh, we know around the world that so many of them have been imprisoned. Uh, so many of them have been killed. Uh, but think back to just recent times. I mean, even in this era, there were uh, packages sent, threats of bombings for CNN and, and other news media, threats to journalists, uh, career threats, but also physical threats and violence to media. We had, uh, you know, the, the ex-president has done the same thing with uh, his rallies and things where he would demonize the media, but also incorporate physical threats to media. Uh, they better watch out. There's a Second Amendment. There's, there's the a lot of these are real threats. He called the press the enemy of the people. So it's, it's, it's part of their, their strategy. The anyway. term fake news was yeah. coined by him. And yeah. now we see it being used in Brazil and Turkey and Hungary and Russia as a common term. And that, I think, is a very important point. Uh, you know, that America used to be kind of the beacon of democracy for the world. And, um, you know, and without it, uh, I think a lot of countries would you know, feel less confident in what they were trying to do in terms of a democratic uh, uh, process. When you watch the United States of America begin to waver uh, like this, uh, it's it has repercussions that go way beyond this. I remember I was giving a talk um, in in Germany um, and uh, in, in Berlin, and you know, right there where the the wall used to exist. And the person taking me, driving me in from the airport was saying, we look to you, your country, as the longest surviving, you know, democratic country out there. And, and I hadn't really thought of it in those terms back then. You know, as a historian, I kind of think of us as the, the, the late arrivals um, to Europe. But no, when you look at it in terms of the kind of government we have, and so many European governments have, we're the one that's, uh, been around for for all this time and to see it imperiled at this point is deeply disturbing not only to to um americans but to people around the world just and, you know part of my job uh, nat is uh foreign affairs uh, chair you know with europe in particular with our allies uh, i've had discussions all during this time uh, with our allies private discussions you know diplomacy and diplomatic discussions are one thing the private conversations i've had uh, just echoes exactly what you said. They look to the U.S. as the beacon. The, those people that are pro-democracy and those groups fighting authoritarianism, they use us as the example. Uh, and to have that video, to have that scene that is all over the world and, and keeps mm -hmm. getting run all over the world of January 6th and the attack on the Capitol uh, really shook them as much as it shook any American. Uh, and even today in private conversations, there's a concern, a, a, a layer of skepticism. Uh, yes, we're, we're back on track from where we were, but will it stay that way? So we're uh, already 45 minutes into our discussion here. And um, I just want to try to try to end the show on, on a positive uh, note. Um, you know, uh, Bill, this afternoon you're participating in a standout at the Falmouth Village Green. I'm going to be at one in uh, Sandwich. But beyond those kind of things that citizens can do, uh, what do each of you think that um, citizens can do to uh, kind of head off where we're going? Because there's a lot of people seeing a convergence of dark clouds, if I can use the weather media uh, metaphor. Uh, that you know, when, when there's a when there's a bad weather system coming from the west and one from the south, there's going to be problems in New England. There's a lot of people that see that storm gathering, especially as early as this midterm election in 2022. So, uh, do you have any uh, uh, uplifting advice for what citizens can do? Well, uh, I'll go back to January 6th uh, as part of this. Uh, I was getting calls from. Uh, my local media in Boston, you know, uh, that had my cell phone. And I told them I'm not leaving this place until we certify 
uh, those ballots. And interestingly enough, in a bipartisan sense, Mitch McConnell over in the Senate side uh, had said, we're not leaving this place until after we certify those ballots. One thing to remember, we persevered that day. We took a, a, an unexpected and serious attack on a democracy. But at the end of that day, we certified those votes. We moved forward. And, and that's something to keep in mind. Yet, this is a continuing threat. And it's a growing threat. And you talk about the hurricane coming. It's coming. And it's coming in 22. And it's coming in 24. Canada. Uh, one of the most respected political pundits in Canada just today said he expects authoritarian rule in the U.S. by 2030. That's our closest allied country. Uh, so this is real. So what can we do? Uh, first of all, we can protect the strongest tool we have, our vote. And there are, there's legislation that passed the House that should be taken up by the Senate, the, the Freedom to Vote Act, that gives some type of uh, uh, balance and protection in place to some of the outrageous uh, actions that are taking part in state and local governments on the election front. Um, our courts, uh, the Supreme Court, there's a concern. They won't stand up the way they have. Some of their rulings have clearly indicated that they're giving more uh, influence to the states, but hopefully uh, they still have authority that they can exercise. Our Justice Department, and we didn't even talk about this, but the efforts that were made in the last four years and during this uh, and after uh, this uh, attack on our Capitol in January 6th, don't forget, even though the attorney general for Donald Trump said the election was Joe Biden's, that, that it was a free and fair election result, even though he said it, even though so many other people said it, even though 60 court cases said it, they have still gone forward. So we need that protection going forward and we need an engaged Justice Department looking at what happened on January 6th uh, so that the American public has a better sense uh, of how serious this was, that this included an actual plot as part of it, an actual coup as part of this. Uh, first thing we have to do is get to the facts and the truth of where we stand and what happened. Because without that, we can't go forward. We've had people, that, so many people, respected people uh, on the other side have just said, we've just got to go forward. We've got to get this behind us. We can't go forward without knowing exactly what happened. And there are things we can do legislatively to do it. Uh, and in the last analysis, the greatest power we have is in the American public itself. Uh, you know, uh, democracy, uh, it's often said, uh, democracy uh, is threatened most when good citizens fail to vote uh, and get involved. So there's a great part of going forward to protect our democracy that rests in the power that people have individually. But we can't have that power that people have being diminished by what's going on right now, particularly on their rights to vote. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Mr. Philbrick? Yeah, I, you know, if, if we're looking for a positive uh, point of view or something to do, all I can say is I am by nature a pessimist. <laughs> but when it comes to this, this country um, and when it comes to the resilience of, of the institutions that were created mm -hmm. by the Constitutional Convention, I have real faith. Um, uh, you know, uh, Bill, you referred to uh, people that if, if the vote counted, you think they might have voted differently. I think we may have the storm clouds may be breaking soon and people will have to actually look the horror in the face. And my hope is that people from across all sides of the aisle will be willing to say once they've seen what actually was going on, this is what happened. So I, I, you know, there, this country has seen a lot of challenges in the past. Um, you know, we were born in a revolution uh, we were born out of violence, uh, contained, a kind of contained combativeness is a part of a democratic process. We've contained it. You know, it's, it's messy, it's confusing, um, it's inefficient, but no one has invented a better system of government. And I have faith that, yes, it's not going to be necessarily pretty, 
uh, in the months and years ahead. But hopefully, um, people will be able to, you know, we'll, we'll get through this, and it will be our institutions and the rule of law that will ultimately prevail. And, and I would be remiss, Bill, before I hand it back to you and, and, and Nat, thank you so much for everything you're doing, uh, to say uh, in, integrally in this is the freedom of the press. How much we've learned about what happened on January 6th, how much we've learned about uh, so many of the things that have undercut our democracy of late and going into the future, uh, I'm sure. Uh, we need a free and engaged press uh, to go forward. Uh, that separates us from the other countries as well. Uh, and I, I dare say we would know half of what we know now if it wasn't for an engaged press uh, going forward. And instead of demonizing that press, we should embrace uh, that freedom that we have. Uh, and we should work with the knowledge that's there and, and have some confidence going forward that as long as we adhere to a rule of law, as long as we have a free press, and as long as we have an engaged citizens, citizenry uh, involved and, and elected officials who will uh, speak up even to their own detriment politically, uh, there's reason for confidence going forward. But those are pillars that we have to have. Yeah. Congressman Keating and, and Mr. Philbrick, thank you so much for your time and, and your insights. Uh, you've left a, a really good ending message for our viewers today. Thank you again for your time. And thank, thank you, you, Bill. Thank you, Nat. Thank you, Phil.